the Intellectual Gentlemen's Club. Welcome back to the IGC, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jason Abbott. I want to thank everybody again for subscribing, tuning into the podcast, sharing it out, discussing it, and uh, basically getting the word out there. So appreciate everybody. I always say that uh, I would rather you support to our guests. Um, so please support our guests today if, if you can. If you have anything left over, we're not going to turn you away. You can uh, find out about how to support us at www.intellectualgentlemensclub.com backslash support. There you'll find our affiliate links for Amazon.com, Audible.com, and the Total Human Optimization Company, Onnit.com. We also have a PayPal button in there, so you can donate directly through a credit card. It makes it real easy. Um, but something important about the affiliate links is it doesn't cost you anything additional. If you want to purchase anything from those three companies, I would really appreciate it if you just go over there and use the links. Um, it just comes off of uh, marketing funds for those companies, so would take a little bit back from corporate America and uh, give it to the little guys here. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce our guest today. Uh, first, we have Paul Moran. He is the host of Open Mat Radio. It's a jiu-jitsu culture podcast. He's got tons of great interviews on there. Uh, I think they just hit their 100th episode. He's a school psychologist who graduated from University of Buffalo, and he is the co-host of the Journey podcast with uh, one of our previous guests, Nick Gabriel. Welcome, Paul. Thanks for being on. Uh, dude, it's a pleasure to be on. It's it's funny being on this side of the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome. Um, somebody else that we have here today, um, Paul's had him on Open Mat Radio, and he's really influenced me in uh, my jiu-jitsu journey. Uh, that's Stuart Cooper. He's a world traveler. He's a martial arts instructor for Bra Brazilian jiu-jitsu and Muay Thai. He's, a, he's in Thailand a lot. Uh, he hails from the U.K., he is a top-notch, probably the best-respected independent filmmaker in the BJJ and MMA world. Um, super inspirational and motivational, really high-quality work in HD. Uh, right now, he's got an Indiegogo campaign uh, to keep him going and to support him to uh, get some more of these great documentaries out there. Stuart, thanks for being on. appreciate you being here. Oh, thank you for inviting me on. really appreciate it. Well, just off of, on a personal note first... Um, you know, you guys are higher level in your jiu-jitsu careers. Paul, I believe you're a purple belt. Is that right? Yep. yep. Uh, Stuart, you're a brown belt? Uh, brown belt, yeah. Okay. So you guys are way more high level here. Obviously, I'm just a white belt. I just started back in uh, in November, and I really had been tuned in to jiu-jitsu for a while, starting back when I started listening to Rogan, and he just kept pounding jiu-jitsu in my head. And uh, <laughs> I had a couple buddies that had rolled in the past, and they wanted me to uh, come to the gym. So finally, I... I, I got rid of uh, a few of my outstanding commitments, and I was able to free up some time. It's something I really wanted to devote myself to, and and I got involved in that. But but part of that, there's a couple real influential figures here. One is uh, Nick Gabriel, who I mentioned already. He's been on the show a couple times. Mm -hmm. um, Paul, you know, I listened to Open Mat Radio when I first got started. Understanding it helped me understand a, a lot more about the jiu-jitsu culture and uh, where things came from, the history behind everything. So it's very informative podcast. But Stuart, your videos, especially when uh, I originally found Nick through London Real, and um, I watched the Spirit of Jiu Jitsu, the film you did, the documentary, oh, yeah. and it was just it just took me off guard. I wasn't expecting something that high quality right off of YouTube, just available for free, and then you know it led me down the rabbit hole with more of your videos. Uh, jiu Jitsu: A Way of Life is uh, one of my other favorites, uh, but the music you pick is is like top notch all the shots and interviews that you've done real top notch work so thanks for inspiring me to start my own journey on that um i got a long way to go i'm i'm still trying to survive out there on the mats <laughs> um but uh on a personal note again thanks a lot so oh no man i didn't expect it to uh didn't expect anything like this to happen so yeah um thank you for uh watching my videos <laughs> no problem buddy um let me just, I want to throw the question out to both of you, whoever wants to go first, you know, we're, we're pretty informal over here. Uh, what got you, uh, what brought you to the mats? What brought you to BJJ? And, and what time of life were you in? Were you in uh, any kind of transitional phases? Uh, usually, um, you know, there's some kind of catalyst behind starting a martial art. Stu, you want to go first? 
Uh, sure, yeah. yeah. I was actually, it was quite late really. Um, I was 23 when I first started uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu when I was actually just finished university. And uh, like everybody else, I saw USC and TV. <laughs> and, um, you know, from the whole youth, you know, um, I always do martial arts. I never found anything that I thought was, you know, effective in a street fight. Because I used to get in a lot of trouble in school. So I always wanted to learn how to, you know, defend myself. So I went to, um, you know, karate and a bunch of other things like taekwondo, but not, and <laughs> tried using it in a couple of, of occasions and realized it didn't work. And then when I reached the age of 23 or so, I didn't know what UFC was or Jiu Jitsu was. I saw it on TV. I was like, whoa, this is real. What the hell is this? And I asked my friends and he told me what it was. And I went down to a Muay Thai lesson. It was an MMA lesson. I didn't know what that was. And I went to that afterwards. But people kept on taking me down. And, you know, and I didn't know what a triangle or an armbar was, but they kept on submitting me. And that's what fascinated me the most was these people half my size just making me tap and tap. And I was like, I've got to learn this. I have to learn this. So um, ever since that day, I've been do. I just got addicted. You know, <laughs> actually, I have an obsessive compulsive disorder. So luckily, <laughs> I found something to channel my OCD, which is why I've uh, excelled in it pretty fast in about five, five and a half years, I think. Yeah, I myself am in the same type of way. When I uh, when I find something I like, everybody who knows me can account for this. I kind of immerse myself completely. Um, some would say I kind of go off the deep end sometimes, but yeah. hey, man, it's living life, and I kind of want to squeeze every drop out of it I can sometimes. So, Paul, how about you? What, what got you started? Um, pretty somewhat similar to everybody else, I guess. Uh, watched old UFCs, and uh, I was a lacrosse player. I grew up in Buffalo, New York, and – I was, you know, hardcore into lacrosse. I mean, my stick came in, came with me everywhere I went, and uh, it's what I lived and breathed. And then I blew my knee out when I was 14 and rehabbed it, did surgery, all that. Or I didn't do surgery yet, but I rehabbed it. And my first game back, I blew it out uh, a second time. So then they just told me, you know, you can't even do PE class. You're, um, you can't play sports in the school district, anything. So that – you know, taking taking something that I love so so much with lacrosse and really kind of just taking it out of my hands, I um, didn't have anything to replace it. So there are some rough years going through high school. Uh, I finally had knee surgery. I went to take a Krav Maga class of all things, just because my friends were doing it, and uh, blew my knee out. Like just doing a running thing that you have to run, stop, and then start punching. And when I went to stop, there was no stopping. My knee just totally blew out. Jeez. So that's when I, yeah, that's when I had the big knee surgery. And I figured I got to find something that doesn't involve a lot of running or cutting or anything. I had stopped back at a play. And this was when right around ultimate fighter season one, I was like, Oh, I should get back into this, but there was no instruction anywhere. And I think that Buffalo was probably about as, um, advanced in jujitsu as you know the uk was at the time i mean there just wasn't anybody so i'm sorry how many years ago would you say this is uh i'm like horrible when it comes to factual information i think <laughs> i've been training like seven or eight years now i'm so back then it was it was hard to find a black belt pretty much right yeah i found a purple belt so it's funny i went back to that that uh they used to teach chinese ground fighting whatever the hell that is um, at the place that I took the Krav Maga lesson. So I went back there and was like, hey, do you guys have any wrestling, any type of grappling, anything at all? And they said no. I checked Sure Dog later that day, and Chuck Anzalone had just announced that he's um, going to be doing a seminar in Buffalo. He was a purple belt under Carson at the time, Carlson Gracie Sr., uh, and that he was doing this small you know, six-week course. So it was like one day a week. I went there. Uh, for three classes, and then I had a backpacking trip set up with a buddy of mine to go to Italy, went to Italy, came back, and my first class back was a Carlson Gracie seminar, and Carson actually had to get like on the mat, stop warm-ups, show me how to hip escape, you know, so go to have like three classes and then get on the mat with who I argue is one of the greatest one of, of the all greats, time. right. 
um, it was kind of surreal. So I stayed in Buffalo for a year and then ended up moving to Vegas for work opportunities and, you know, do my school psych internship and everything. So yeah, I would have started jujitsu. It would have been my second year of grad school. So I was probably 25, something like that. Okay. Then I trained two years with a Carlson Gracie team out here, uh, two or three years, had some differences of opinion uh, with the instructor on where the team and different things were going. And took a summer off to just kind of train all over Vegas with under the auspice of, Hey, this is kind of like my dating period. Like wherever I go, I'm going to stay. I'm not a gym jumper at all. And ended up finding Sergio Pena, who has been one of the most influential people in my life from that day forward. One of my best friends, my mentor, my, you know, master in jujitsu, all all that stuff. Uh, And I couldn't be happier. And that's where we're at now. That's great. Um, Stu, who do you train under? Um, I'm actually under Lucio Legato Rodriguez. Um, well, actually, I count a lot of people. I'm also under a guy called Paul Hartley and Lucio Sergio de Santos. We actually have, have three black belts at my academy in the UK, so I have to count all three of them. Right. But then yeah. now in Thailand, I've been training with Fernando Macachero. He's a different team, so I stay loyal to Gracie Barra Preston, like always. Um, but he's a big part of, you know, uh, for the last two years I've been with Fernando Makashara and he's taught me like so many, like a new, a new style of jiu-jitsu, which is the, le- the leg lock game. I was always in training in the gi and it's all no gi, uh, submission wrestling in Thailand, you know, because it's a lot of MMA fighters mm-hmm. and it's an MMA camp. And obviously in the gi, we don't get taught heel hooks or calf crushes or, anything like that and when I was going there I was getting heel hooked all over the place and people doing twisters and stuff and then that's what I've been focusing on for the last two years so I've really got into that and that's because of Fernando Macachero so uh, I'm loving the leg locks now I've come back here and I'm, I'm training in the gi and I'm like having trouble with everyone in the gi in Preston you know? well he actually <laughs> didn't he come from Brazilian top team yeah, he did. Yeah, and he is. He's from Brazilian top team. He's yeah, so, uh, back on the Marillo Bustamante. Yeah, and Marillo is also the man responsible for Tequino, who's it's, arguably the best footlocker in MMA, if not all of grappling. So you can yeah. see how that influence might find its way in your game. That's pretty sick. Still need to see him go up against Dean Lister to see who's the best. I think Dean will take that one, to be honest. <laughs> Dude, I had it so close to happening when we were going to do ADCC trials out um, out here and ended up not working with ADCC, but it was close. <laughs> it was close. Uh, that needs, it will happen at some point. It has to. Oh, yeah. yeah. I don't know why Matt and Morris haven't put that together. <laughs> maybe Give maybe uh, Matt and Morris 4, huh? Yeah, if there is one. I hope yeah. there is. Yeah. Um... Well, what got you into filmmaking? Like, I, I mean, I, I guess I, I can see two and two go together. It's something you like to do, and jujitsu is your passion, and you naturally you can blend them. Uh, but what made you just kind of immerse yourself full into it? And and how did you get started? Did you need to do a, like uh, I think you mentioned in your video on the Indiegogo is you had to do a lot of weddings um, yeah, just exactly. to kind of supplement until. Uh, so how did that all start? Well, it all started actually. I was um, I left the university, realized that the degree I got, I was basically got a qualification in nothing. I mean, I couldn't get a job. <laughs> That's pretty much what I where I was. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I wouldn't. You can't regret anything because I met a lot of cool people, and you know, my pathways ended up pretty good anyway. So I wouldn't change anything. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, fuck, what was the question? Uh, how did you get started with the filmmaking? Oh, the filmmaking, yeah. So then, I, because I was so bored, I could not get a job. I took up Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu full-time. And then I liked it so much, and I started winning like competitions everywhere as a blue belt and a white belt. I won pretty much every competition that was in the UK. So I decided to just do that full-time. I was like, right, I want to be a Jiu-Jitsu fighter. Yeah, the writing's on the wall, to- right? <laughs> Yeah, that, well, that, that was my goal. I said, right, I'm, this is what I'm going to do, you know. And I've, like I said, I've got OCD. I'm going to do this 100%, and I was. And I had the two amateur MMA fights back-to-back. Then I thought, mm, maybe I'll go down this route. 
And then I got my uh, one day in training, accident, um, an accident, I got my arm completely dislocated the opposite direction. Mm. So that put me, on a, uh, put me out for seven months. So even though I got back training after seven months, it still took, you know, a year before I could train properly. And then, uh, but during that time, I actually had a little video camera that my mom and dad got me as a Christmas present. So because I like jujitsu so much, I was filming tournaments and editing the footage together on iMovie, just playing around, making little like um, jiu-jitsu tournament highlight reels. And they're actually on YouTube, YouTube on my old YouTube account. And you can see them. I thought they were awesome at the time, and they're terrible. But at the time, <laughs> everyone was saying, oh, these are awesome. You should keep it up. And then as soon as I got back training again, I started to reach a really good level again, started to um, do really well. I was in a, an advanced tournament as a blue belt, and I was beating um, – this brown belt, I think. No, no, purple belt. I can't remember what belt he was. Um, but I was winning, and by a lot of points, two seconds left, uh, he catches me in a foot lock. Oh. <laughs> and, um, I was just not going to tap. No way. Because I, really, I was winning by that much, and I was clearly the better grappler, and it would have been a big win for me. Um, I, I just refused to tap, and then my foot broke in half. Oh, <laughs> so... Man. Well, I can... Again, so then I picked up the video camera again. Um, just again started um, filming grappling tournaments, and then Jason Tan actually wanted. The, he's actually a former UFC veteran, fought it as a welterweight in UFC twice, and he's the promoter of ground control grappling tournament here in UK. He put up a post on um, Facebook saying he's looking for a guy, a cameraman who can film his grappling tournament so everyone put my name forward um, and so I did that and then at that time I had upgraded my camera equipment to a much better higher quality camera and he was really impressed with my work really impressed and he invited me down to a Ryan Hall seminar and said why don't you come down and film that and uh, see if you can do something you're like you're really good with this video camera so I went down filmed the Ryan Hall seminar edited it together because I still didn't have a job at this time. He's like, dude, you're really good at this. This is actually really good. And at that, then I realized, whoa, because I had like 4,000 views in one day. I was like, holy crap, that's like a lot. And I was real, quite blown away by that. And he goes, dude, keep this up. Gunnar Nelson's doing a seminar in like two weeks in Manchester. So then, you know, I went and filmed Gunnar Nelson's seminar and from there, Jason Tan put me in contact with Bradley Esteema, where I made the road to ADCCs. And um, next thing I know, I've got a backstage pass to ADCC to do the highlight, uh, ADCC highlight 2011. Um, and through that, my friend was getting married, and he wanted me to film his wedding, which I did. And then that led into uh, wedding filmmaking as well. So it was kind of all by accident. So you could say that me getting my arm dislocated and my foot broke, was the best thing that ever happened to me because now I have to be a full-time <laughs> MMA or jiu-jitsu fighter. Right on. Uh, just, you know, we've, been, just... <laughs> we've been talking about injuries. You know, uh, Paul, you mentioned your injuries, Stu. You just mentioned yours as well. I, it was interesting. I, I mentioned I started jiu-jitsu back in November, and second week in February uh, we were doing like a controlled role. And I went for it's it's very hazy right now. I went for like a lumberjack sweep or something like that. I would I had been working on with a with a blue belt that <laughs> been kind of taking me under his wing a little bit. And when I went over to grab the mount, um, he fell on my leg and broke my fib. And uh, you know it's it's very frustrating when you find something that you really enjoy and it's a great outlet for stress. You know you sweat your ass off, you get your body moving, and you kind of I need something furious sometimes to kind of burn the energy out of me. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, to make you feel alive, basically. And you know, I, I started rolling again last week. I think I probably overtrained a little bit because uh, I was so anxious. But you know, I, my legs hurting pretty good today. But you know, after nine and a half weeks, um, I was fortunate to be able to. Uh, my, me and my son started training at the same time, and and he's That's nine. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, after class, I would just stick around. Um, after his class, I would just stick around and, you know, three times a week I'd, I'd watch class. Uh, 
So I, I was hoping that a lot of this would would uh, just by osmosis come into my brain, you know, and and, it and, does. Uh, and make me better. Yeah. So this week I felt um, rusty, but I felt more comfortable and more confident on what I'm supposed to be doing. And you know, I'm obviously I'm still trying to survive out there, but. Um, I think it was definitely helpful just sitting around and watching different styles of people roll and, and you know, watching the higher level blue and purple belts. And uh, we have a couple brown belts at our gym that are just basically evil. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just, just watching that is it it tough. At, at the end, you know, I was ready to get back. You know, I had a good attitude for a long time, but it, it does wear on you. And, you know, you're talking like you're out for seven months. That, that must have been, you know, pretty devastating. Oh, it's horrible. The only thing that saved me... Uh, was my little dog Horace, well, my mom and dad's dog, you know, because I had a um, dislocated arm. It was I couldn't do anything, so I went went and took him on like five mile walks every day, <laughs> twice a day. Mm -hmm. So like me and my dog become best friends. <laughs> Man's best friend, that's right. <laughs> yeah, oh, that dog was so loyal to me. So that's what that's what got me through those seven months was walking, and he kept me in shape as well. Do you feel like when you guys come back from an injury like that, where do you feel like you're reinvigorated and you're obviously like you're well rested? Like, you know, after a roll, obviously, you know, sometimes you need some Advil or something for some creaks that are that are yeah. uh, that are turning up. But, you know, I, I noticed, you know, once I was off the mat for a month, like my back felt, you know, so much better and I wasn't twisted up anymore. I, I still feel pretty good other than my leg. But do you feel like you got a a jump when you came back? Yeah, I felt pretty good. I was surprised at how well I did when I came back. Everyone said, like, all my training partners were like, cool, you've not lost anything, have you? Um, and I felt really good. I wasn't as tight because I have a very tight pressure game. Um, but one thing I did notice was just, you know, like uh, how sore my body was the next day. And when you've had that amount of time off, I think you, uh, when you've been doing jiu-jitsu for a while, your skin toughens up. Because I hadn't, mm -hmm. uh, and because I hadn't done it for such a long time, like I looked like a lapid again, you know, bruises all mm -hmm. over my body and my chest. So that you know, that uh, came again. But um, no, during that time off, I never stopped studying it. You know, I was always, always been around it. Something that uh, really helped me out was when I was off the mats. Nick, you know, he just came out with his uh, his book at that time, The Black Belt mm -hmm. Blueprint. And really, um, he sent me a, a copy of it uh, before it released, and I was able to just kind of dive in. And with all that downtime, I was like, yeah, this is what I need. I need something to kind of explain me. You know, the, watching videos is one thing, but when you have um, Nick's book like that, it, you know, it includes the hyperlinks to YouTube on, on the actual drills he's mentioning and things like that. It really helped me understand the concepts a lot more on, like, side control and mount and taking the back and you know, these leverage points and how to create space. It was uh, it's something that really helped me out, especially all the detail that was involved with the drawings and things like that. So I highly recommend anybody out there to check that one out. It's yeah, available it's a, at uh, blackbeltblueprint.com. It's a great book for sure. And I think that as far as dealing with injuries and everything, it depends on where you're, what stage you're at in jujitsu. Sure. Um, I think... It also depends on what you do in your downtime. So, like, if you are studying things, if you're watching footage or instructionals or whatever, uh, even the mirror neurons in your brain fire when you're watching something happen. You don't have to always be doing it. Obviously, it's better if you do it, but just watching can can definitely be beneficial. And then I, I think that a good way to get back is go train, like, go train with your kids' class. Um, Having to explain things to kids is really good because you'll have to have a better understanding yourself. Dealing with pure technique and not having to use strength or anything is always good uh, to bridge yourself back into training. And then just starting with lighter people and then working your way up is a good way to deal with injuries. With all the cancer treatment and stuff that I've had to go through the past couple of years, like my training's been very sporadic. And I had a long stretch off. I came back and I can say like – I caught more black belts in the time that I had just come back to the mat than I had in all the years before that. So wow. being able to let your mind kind of rest and your body rest and approach things um, with kind of fresh eyes can be beneficial. But I think the longer you've trained, the easier it is to get back. Sure. I can, uh, I can see that. Yeah. yeah. 
So if you haven't been training a really long time, sometimes just doing basic, basic drills is really good at home. And just like Mike Fowler told me the one time, and Paul Schreiner is also another big advocate, do what you can. Don't just be completely away from it. If your right hand is broken, then you can do some grip drills with your left hand. Or if your knees hurt, you know, then just play guard. Like try to do something uh, and it'll it'll definitely help. And if you can't do anything physical, then watch something. Mm. But there's always something you can be doing every day to be 1% better. So you, you mentioned um, your cancer treatments, Paul. Mm -hmm. um, so that must have been a real blow, man, finding something like that out and going through treatments. Did, I'm sure that it gave you, well, from listening to the journey, I can tell that it had a profound effect on your view of life. What can you yeah. say about that? For sure. I mean, it's it's the uh, it's the black on the page. It's it's the stuff that provides contrast for all the good things in life. So just can't have light without can't have light without the dark and all that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it it's it's contrast. It can be the worst thing that ever happens to you, and it can be the best thing. So it's all about how you approach it. If you approach it as an opportunity to learn from it and to reevaluate your situation. It can be a very powerful, motivating thing. If you just want to collapse under the pressure of all of it, I mean, you can choose to do that too. I don't think your outcome is going to be as good, but <laughs> it's, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's how you approach things. And I always tell the story about uh, my coach, Sergio Pena, who was one of the greatest uh, jujitsu fighters in his era. He used to get, to his academy, as Valdo Alves Academy, and Sergio went from purple to black belt, not by choice, but because the Gracies had put a lot of pressure to get Sergio promoted because he was going to have to fight Hickson at some point, and they wanted that sooner than later. Anyways, that's a long story. As Valdo would send guys after Sergio every day at the academy and just tell him, you know, to beat him. So he'd get shark tanked every Trial by fire, day. right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And Sergio, the way that he explained it is, you know, it's just these are lions. He would send lions to me every single day. And my job was to pile the lions high, you know, and some days it'd be three, some days it'd be 15. And every day he stepped on the mat, he would just say, it's just another lion to kill. Well, so that they, became... they, I've, I've also heard, you know, you see it all these little quotes everywhere, but something rang true is like, uh, it said, if you want to become a lion, you must train with lions, right? Yeah. <laughs> Quite yeah, literally. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So for sure. And, and that just became my mantra in, in everything. If I had to have another surgery, another radiation session, another chemo session, whatever it is, it's just another line to kill. You know, it's forging it's you thing. deeper, right? Yeah. So that's kind of my, my whole life philosophy basically boils down to stuff I've learned through um, pretty much jujitsu and especially from Sergio. So with Open Mat Radio, what made you start a podcast? Like, I mean, that's, that's kind of a jump. You know, people ask me all the time, well, what got you started in it? And, and mine was just, uh, you know, curiosity to have these conversations that I'm listening sure. to. And, you know, it just, it's amazing. Now I can talk to people across the globe and put it yep. out for free. And, you know, I, the response for, you know, the IGC has been more than I was anticipating. You know, I figured, yeah, yeah I'd get like maybe 20, 50 listeners or something like that. But, seems like every time, you know, we're gaining momentum. And again, everybody appreciate out there for spreading the word. So what made you start? What made you take that leap? And um, did you have any experience with uh, with any kind of web interface? Or, no, I know, you know nothing yeah, about you know, did I, uh, any of that stuff. And that's like, so it started the three of us, myself, uh, Rafael Pena, Sergio's son, and Richard Heinrich, who is uh, one of our training partners. And the three of us had helped out run a couple of world pro tournaments and worked well together and I told the guys like hey that was kind of fun working on a different side of jiu-jitsu giving back through uh, promoting the tournament because uh, we all all three of us believe that jiu-jitsu totally changed our lives and that it, we had a responsibility to give something back just as a, a, a mean of thanks if nothing else so I said hey guys I'm going to start a podcast and they're like oh let's do it and it was like oh okay well all three of us will do it so that's what we did is um, we started doing that and they both life has kind of gotten to a point that I'm able to keep the show going and they're both focused on different things. So I'm kind of doing it myself for probably the past, I don't know how many months. Um, but it basically got started because I was a huge fight works podcast fan and, um, Caleb, 
who is still the godfather of, of podcasting for jiu-jitsu and still has the best interviews and always will. He had well over 200 episodes uh, and still knocks him out once in a while. He does a lot of commentating for the IBJJF now. Uh, Caleb was just slowly dwindling his uh, frequency down. So kind of got his blessing and everything. And we're kind of humbly following in the footsteps of the Fightworks podcast. And the whole goal is just to more or less educate people on what's going on that's good in the sport, um, kind of disseminate some news, get some history out there that's not just through the lens of, you know, one specific family or one specific uh, person and just kind of go from there. And it's been an amazing thing for me. I've met, you know, guys like Stuart and Scotty Nelson from OTM and Nick. And I mean, it's brought so many good people into my life that I, it's one of the best choices I ever made. Right on. Mm. So um, let's talk a little bit about the jujitsu lifestyle. Um, I think it has, well, people have targeted it almost as like a, uh, a surfer type of martial art or the lazy art or something mm-hmm. like that. I, I disagree. I mean, I see guys working their ass off in the gym. There's nothing lazy about it. But mm-hmm. I, I think what the difference is between a lot of other martial arts, Stuart, you mentioned before, you know, training a lot of stand up or with Taekwondo. I had a little experience with Taekwondo a few years ago and, and noticed those holes. But it seemed like uh, with Jiu Jitsu, basically, the whole idea of jujitsu also is to not use force, to use technique and to only expel your energy when it's absolutely necessary. So if you take that, that, uh, the fundamental theory behind that and you add it to your life, it seems like there can be great changes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how is it, uh, how has the lifestyle changed for you? Uh, so before you started train, were you, um, well, Paul, you and I, I think we, we're we're more on the same wavelength as far as like daily life. We both have full time jobs. Stuart, you are the world traveler. You're kind of more of an independent person. Yeah. Did that change at any point, um, or were you, have you always been kind of like that? It's um, it's something I always wanted to do, but never had the courage to do it. And that's what jujitsu helped me with. Um, a, a documentary actually came out today on me. Um, because a few people have actually requested it. So a few of my friends at Tiger Muay Thai recorded um, and edited together a documentary on me. And I talk about it in that, how if you met me five years ago, I there's no, you wouldn't really get much out of me. I had no confidence, very low self-esteem. Um, and jiu-jitsu, because you have to mix with people, you've got all the different kinds of people on the mat, but you don't know what kind of jobs you have. You could have a bin man in one area, a lawyer, you know, attorney. Yeah, it's very diverse. Especially part. My, my gym, I know so, it is. But you're on the mat, you're all equal. You're all the same. And because uh, I'm partnered up with different people all the time, and um, it, I don't know, it just, gave, just gives you confidence over time. It took about two years. I remember Nick saying, because when Nick came out to Thailand, to film the spirit of jiu-jitsu with me. He even, because he was my teacher when I was a blue belt down at Roger Grace Academy. He oh, actually okay. said to me, um, dude, I can't believe how much you've changed. Like when you were at Roger Grace Academy, like you never spoke, you never said a word, which is actually true. I kept myself to myself and I don't know what happened really. Just as I said, entry came out of my shell, you know, I was, a, I was a late bloomer and, yeah, uh, jiu-jitsu real, and that, that there was no doubt that uh, jiu-jitsu did that. No doubt. I know for me, um, when I first made a decision to hit the gym, um, I went in there and I talked with Todd, and he's the owner of the gym, and he showed me around a little bit and gave me the rundown. Everybody has been like top notch. I mean, everybody has been. You know, I, I recognize there's some dramas in jiu-jitsu. Um, just like there is in everything else in life, but mm-hmm. it seems like um, you know the community's there. And when I realized that this is something I want to do and kind of devote myself, I I kind of came out of my shell as well. I'm more or less a shy individual. You may not think it because I have a podcast and you know I I talk and release these things and all kinds of crazy stories on the internet. But <laughs> um, when you get me face to face, I I'm more of like an introvert, I guess you could say. 
And I made it a point to kind of introduce myself to everybody and get out there a little bit. I, was, I used to be the guy that would sit in the corner and uh, I was a bald headed tattooed guy that was sitting in the corner looking pissed off. And that's not how I was feeling inside, but that, you know, that's, that's what people were seeing. And yeah. people were telling me that, you know, they brought it to my attention and uh, I decided to, to kind of make a change over the last few years and introduce myself more and kind of get out there and, just meeting all these guys at the gym has been great. Um, you know, from the white belts, blue, purple, brown, and the black belts even, you know, everybody seems to mesh cohesively. Uh, when I go to class, the instructors, you know, can feel like I can shake their hands instead of, I remember when I was in Taekwondo, it was like a very standoffish, you know, you don't introduce yourself to the master and this and that. It's it's so much more laid back and everybody's just buddies there, it seems like, and everybody's there to help each other out. It's just a great community, I think. So, That's Jason, one, let me. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. I, you know, I was uh, just going to say um, one thing that I definitely took away from Jiu Jitsu was, you know, being polite with people and shaking the hand when I meet them. And that is because of Jiu Jitsu. That's something I never used to do. And my granddad used to say to me, Stuart, you need to, you know, introduce yourself. You need to look people in the eye and shake the hand. And, mm -hmm. you know, now I do it naturally, you know, because of mm -hmm. Jiu Jitsu. Sorry, Paul, go on. <laughs> Oh, I'll go off of that, but then I got something else I want to say really quick. Uh, a good black belt I train with, an amazing black belt, Mike Bland, who we've had on uh, on a podcast before. He's got a – his son is just getting to the age that he's able to start wrestling and stuff. He's like four years old or something like that. And I asked you know, Mike, I'm like, hey, you gonna you going to push him to train? And he's like, well – I'm not going to push him to compete uh, or or train too hard, but I do. He is going to have to learn the basics of, you know, jujitsu and then also some basics of striking. And I said, well, you know, if you're not going to push him into into doing it, what's the point of of getting a, a basis? He said, well, if nothing else, if he if he decides that he never wants to step on the mat ever again, sitting across the table of someone at an office meeting, you present yourself way differently when you know you can kick the shit out of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's a hundred percent true. And I think what yeah. I was going to ask you, Jason, is when you started putting yourself out there a little bit more like socially and everything, did you notice your game when you're rolling also became either a little bit more assertive, more aggressive, more pressure filled or more open? Cause I think that there's a distinct correlation between personality style and how you roll. That's a good question. Um, turn it on me for once, huh? Hey, it's where I'm in my comfort zone. <laughs> um, I would say that it kind of it was cohesive together because um, yeah. really I I started making those changes a couple years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, when I got into the gym, um, I was in that I was out of my comfort zone. I was out of my bubble, and yeah. you know I didn't know anything about jujitsu. All I knew is what fucking Joe Rogan was talking about, and <laughs> you know what Stuart Cooper had on YouTube. You know? Yeah, and uh, so. It, you know, I was very, you know, I was nervous going in and I, I knew that it was going to be fine. I had a good vibe from the place. Um, I didn't know anything about the Kaike affiliates or anything like that or any affiliation. You know, I was going in completely green. So yeah. I, I just made the decision as I went in there to just keep it, keep myself open and meet people. I knew that was the only way that really I was going to succeed because if, if I go into class and I don't talk to anybody and I don't ask questions about, you know, how did you just wrap me up and choke the shit out of me and, and get to know guys a little bit? I knew that I wasn't going to have as good of a time. So just by opening up and, and meeting people slowly but surely, it's been great, you know. And, and now I can walk in the gym and I know probably at least half the guys on a first name basis. And then on, and any day I go in there, guys seen that I was around and, and watching class and now they see me coming back. And, you know, it, it's just uh, I just really enjoy it there. And it's been great meeting people and now some of the i actually did a podcast uh it's probably i think it was probably three releases ago for the igc with uh my instructor big don richard and uh the owner of uh, mass gym where i trained todd alley and uh a bunch of the guys i'm sure listened to it there and pulled me aside and said hey man it was a great interview this and that i know you uh we're a radio guy. I'm like, well, I'm really not. <laughs> you know, it's just, just something I like to do. You know, thanks for tuning in. You know, where'd you hear about it? And so it sparks up conversation as well. And, you know, they see some of my previous topics and it's, it's a hodgepodge show. We talk about all kinds of shit, you know. Yeah. Um, That's what makes it good. Yeah. You know, I like mixing it up and 
there's probably not a huge IGC following that uh, that is on jiu-jitsu, but I hope that fan base is growing. And you know, I just, uh, you know, I've just been really uh, enjoying the ride. Yeah, it's it's definitely one worth taking. It will you will be beat up by the end of it, oh, yeah. but. There's yeah. no point in being a well-preserved corpse, right? That's, you know, that's, yeah, exactly. Uh, that's one thing when I had a, a buddy who trained at the gym, um, he wanted me to come in a couple years ago and roll. And I'm like, you know what, dude, I just, uh, I did Taekwondo. I'm just, I really want to hurt anybody, this and that. It's, I've been kind of uh, like real laid back for, for quite a few years and dabbled in pacifism and uh, vegetarianism and things like that. Just trying to, you know, just purify myself and, you know, the spirit behind my ego and uh but I, i'm the older i get the more i realize that you have to have you know that light and darkness there's these forces that that push against each other so i was like a vegetarian for um probably about a year and a half and i just started reintroducing meat in my diet i don't know if that had anything to do with my leg break you know i mm. you know i don't know but i'm trying to source uh better organic meats things like that, things that are sustainably farmed and things like that. So I'm getting better protein in my diet. Um, You're up in Detroit, right? Yep, yep. Just step outside and shoot something. I mean, (laughs) (laughs) it's not that far from Buffalo, man. You got some amazing organic, you know, meat running around your backyard. Yeah, there's, I found a, I found a a grocery mart that uh, they do wild game uh, from in the state of Michigan. So that's where I've been getting a lot of my meat as well. And I, you know, I wouldn't mind trying hunting. You know, I, I've never hunted before. I was a big fisherman before, but I would like to take responsibility for you know the actions that that happen in the world a little bit. So I, I think I'm I'm a little bit more conscious, I, I guess, than the average person about you know what goes into my body. And and on the same coin, when I know I'm putting good stuff in my body, when I'm dosing myself with chocolate at some nights, you know, I, yeah. I I know what I'm putting in my body, and I know it's not good. So you know the uh, it works both ways, you know. Yeah, I used to be a real, uh, real health freak when I first started jujitsu. Like I said, when I 100% dedicated myself to it, I was exactly the same. You know, nothing went in my body except like complete organic goodness. And um, I even went vegan for three months. But then I smelled this. Uh, I got the smell of bacon sandwiches. <laughs> mom was cooking, so I just changed my mind right there and then. <laughs> Bacon seems to be a weak point for many people. <laughs> yeah, it smells so good, but then I realized I was losing a lot of weight. I was I went down to like seventy four kg, and from eighty four, just from being a vegan, and I started to feel a bit weaker. But now, all of a sudden, it's funny. I used to have trouble losing weight, and now it's the opposite. All of a sudden. You know, I find it hard, like putting on weight, and I eat whatever I want. I've co- I, now I don't, I really don't take a, you know a, a, an interest in what I eat at all, whether it's good or bad for you. I eat whatever the hell I want, and <laughs> for some reason it seems to be working for me. Well, but, yeah, I mean, so. it's it, you can tell from all your pictures, man, on Instagram and and Twitter and Facebook, you know. You're always running around without your shirt off, but you look like fucking <laughs> Captain America out there, man. So well, this is why you're everyone training five times a day. No wonder you can't put weight on. <laughs> everyone needs to support Stuart's Indiegogo campaign because the man doesn't own shirts. It's <laughs> not vanity <laughs> that he's flashing the abs about. He needs he needs an actual shirt. So please go <laughs> buy some and support the best filmmaker in freaking jujitsu. <laughs> Right on. I don't know where that came from because I was a fat kid, I tell you. It's funny, since I've been back in the UK, it's funny, the girls I used to have a crush on in high school, they've obviously, like, you know, I've added them on Facebook over the years or they've added me. Mm-hmm. And I've seen how much I've changed because I only started growing at the age of 23. And this is true. I look like a 12 year old fat kid, <laughs> curly blonde hair till the age of 23. Started training jiu jitsu, started getting in, my body just started to change, I started to grow. And this time of being in the UK, like last week, I've had so many girls hit me up that I used to go to school to uh, school with that used to never talk to me, never said a word to me, even used to say nasty things to me. And I'm like, wow, this is a big turnaround. <laughs> now they're saying different nasty things to you. <laughs> <laughs> the good nasties. Yeah. But what's good is like I don't actually like them anymore. I'm like, you used to be hot, but you're not anymore. <laughs> it's interesting. I got a 20 year reunion 
I'm due for probably um, in the next year here. And I, I've never had a desire to, I, I was always, you know, I mentioned earlier, I'm like, I was an introvert and I was a shy kid. So I didn't have like a lot of friends in high school. They were all outside of high school with like mm-hmm. jobs I had. And um, there were people across town. I had a friend base, but it wasn't at high school. So it was a challenging time for me. Um, but I, I really didn't have um, any desire to see any of those people. And, I, and I'm actually kind of reconsidering that now because I'm realizing as I get older that you know, I've changed a lot in the last 20 years. So what what's to say that some of these bullies 20 years ago haven't changed? And some people I have seen still in the community and they're still assholes. Yeah. <laughs> but, sure. uh, yeah. you know, some, you know, I do believe that a leopard uh, can change its spots um, and, and people can yeah. change at any moment. You know, there's there's certain things that happen in somebody's life. Paul, you know, you mentioned yeah. getting cancer, you know, a, a psychedelic trip. Um, any, anything that shocks you out of your ego can give you an insight to how you're living your life and some changes you can make. And I think that can happen to anybody spontaneously at any point. So I'm willing to give people the benefit of the doubt, probably more than I should. So yeah, it's interesting how you get older and, and, uh, the people you knew, you know, they can change or change their opinion. Or you look like Captain America and want to get in your pants, you know? <laughs> it's funny you should say that. Actually, uh, when I was at school, you know, I, I got picked on a little bit by a few guys. And uh, last week, I bumped into one of them while I was actually meeting up with one of these high school girls. And he'd actually been following me on Facebook. And he was one of them who used to, you know, give me a hard time. Mm-hmm. And he was kissing my ass so much <laughs> because I'm like twice the size of him now. And he's been following what I've been doing, but I was cool with him. Yeah. And, um, now uh, he actually joined up. I, I was just cool with him, and he joined up um, the Gracie Barra like nice. a couple of days oh, ago. Shit. Wow. I actually gave him some advice, and he was like really complimenting me. He's like, I can't believe how much you changed. Like, you meet all the Gracies and stuff. That's incredible. Like, I love the UFC, and and then um, you know. The, Back in the day, I was like, I wanted to fucking slap that guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, I was just like, you know, this guy's been kind of cool with me. I'll, I'll just forget about it. <laughs> well, like they say, um, dragons don't breathe fire because they know they can. You know, it's like yeah. you, you, you don't need to, um, you know, get aggressive. Um, and I find that, you know, it's a big uh, overtone with martial arts. You know, it's, you train so you don't really have to fight. You train to avoid uh, you know, if at all possible and you use, you know, force as a, as a, you know, as a last resort. So I, I think it changes people's ideas of, you know, fighting and, you know, street fighting and things like that. I think, yeah. um, I think overall, I mean, I'm sure there's, you know, there's exceptions to the rule, but overall, if you train martial arts, um, you're more apt to be a more laid back individual, you know, you're, you're more confident about your abilities, you're more confident about yourself when you're in like a bar or something like that. It's, you know, the fear kind of goes away after a while. I remember when I was training in Taekwondo, I felt a lot more confident when I was out. I wasn't looking over my shoulder all the time. I just think now, that, uh, what's that? Did, did you spar when you did Taekwondo? You know, it's, it's, it's amazing because the sparring that we did was non-contact sparring. And I okay. could, I thought it was completely normal at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and every once in a while, well, we, we would train with like bags and things like that, but we would never like free spar with like pads on or anything like that. So when I left Taekwondo, um, because I moved out of state, I didn't stick with it. And, um, I, at the time I didn't want to compete. I didn't want to hurt anybody. You know, I didn't want to lay my hands on anybody and, and get dirty like that. But jujitsu is so much different. You know, it, it forces you to, use it realistically you know at the end of every class you roll you test out what you know and well that and that was my where i was going with it is i think that martial arts in general can be really good but it can also lead to some false sense of security sometimes sure yeah uh even within jujitsu like everybody knows that blue belt that thinks that they can beat everyone's ass but i i think everyone at some point in their life should get punched in the face and held down against their will. And if you get punched in the face and held down and don't like those things, then you can learn to defend yourself. But when you're learning jujitsu or any type of martial art, if you never get the feeling of what it's like to fight a resisting opponent, you can get like 
way out of proportion and think you're way tougher than you are. Sure. And then that first crack in the face, man, you're going to, you'll turn in all your fancy patches and whatever geese you got if you're not ready to deal with it. But if you're at a good school and they really prepare you, um, you know, to deal with some actual violence, then you'll be okay. But these places that everyone stands around and does forms and katas and everything, they're beautiful. But man, I don't know. Like I have, I have a, I work in the high schools, and I have parents come in all the time telling me, like, "Oh, you do jujitsu? That's cute. My kid does, you know, kung fu." It's like, all right, yeah, well, yeah. I'll have all of our kids <laughs> from our kids' class that are like twelve. Um, my my coach's son, he's seventeen. I'll put that kid up against. Um, I'll put him up against almost any grown adult. Uh, martial arts training or not and we'll see who wins because yeah. i know he trains he, and he's he's a tough kid but not everybody that has a black belt is tough that's that's for sure mm -hmm. right. what i like about uh um one of my professors big don he basically every time i've been in one of his classes he focuses on self-defense first so um, cool. he, he has a black belt in judo as well. So we do a lot of uh, takedowns and manipulating your opponent with the gi and, and getting it to the ground. But most of all, it's, he's always he always starts with like his hands out, like, I don't want a problem, man. I don't want a problem, man. And then mm -hmm. he closes, and that's when you clench, and, and that's how things start. But, yeah, I think it's very important to not get so wrapped up in, in technique and realize that, uh, you know, there's some bad dudes out there that uh, that do train like MMA and you never know who you're dealing with nowadays. Like, you know, say 10, 20 years ago, you go into a bar and you're drinking. It's a bar, it's a bar fight. You're going to box. You know, nowadays you're in a bar. There's an MMA fighter on basically every street corner now. So you never know who you're messing with. You never know if they have a weapon. You know, guns are all over the place in the U.S. I mean, mm -hmm. so it, it's a dangerous world out there. And I, I agree with you. If you have like a false sense of what your abilities are, that could be just as dangerous. You get yourself... Uh, in over your head and uh it, sometimes it doesn't work out that well yeah luckily since i've been doing jiu-jitsu i've not been into i've not had one fight since i've been doing jiu-jitsu and i used to get in, get into fights all the time but what do you calm, think changed uh just being calm just talking my way out of it knowing like you said knowing like what you could do to them and um I you think sense of compassion. Yeah, as soon I, I bet. Well, I basically tell them, dude, like, you don't want on, right? Because you have no idea what to do four hours every day, right? <laughs> because <laughs> I know how to defend it. So you will last thirty seconds. Fuck off. <laughs> do you think that you you stay away from those type of situations more now yeah, as well? Exactly. I do definitely stay away from those situations. And when me and my friends are actually going out, like, um, I don't go out much anymore at all. To the pubs and all that. Uh, uh, in Preston, I used to say to a few of my friends who used to get drunk and don't train anything, used to start trouble. I used to always say, Right, guys, no starting any shit tonight, okay? Because I don't want to be involved. Right. And um, <laughs> yeah, but they always would. <laughs> yeah. Well, you end up, it's a, it's, since we were talking about at the beginning how this is a lifestyle kind of thing, you can't yeah. perform well. Whether it's just a regular training session or a tournament, whatever, it doesn't matter. I can't go to open mat on Saturday at noon if I'm hungover from Friday mm -hmm. of drinking, smoking, and eating crap. I'm going to get my ass beat. Like there's no <laughs> way those two lifestyles go together. So yeah. all my friends, I would say the vast majority of them, at least in Vegas, are because of jujitsu. So we'll go out, but it'll be rare. Or if we go out, it's common to go out and not get drunk at all. Just sure. be out, you know. So it's 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 who you put yourself around. And I've surrounded myself with a bunch of positive people that want to take care of themselves. I always joke that I moved to Vegas to clean up my life. <laughs> you know, Sin City, cleaning up your act. Your act. That's great. Well, shit. Compare it to compare it to Buffalo. It's easy to be back in Buffalo, watch a Sabres game two nights a week and a Bills game, and you could be at a bar three four days a week yeah. easy yeah. eating chicken wings and and polishing back you know pictures of blue left and right i don't do that out here i can't you know so i think it's a bit of uh the the 
the cultural element of it is something that helps change your life as much as the techniques themselves. Yeah. One thing I wanted to touch on is, um, Paul, I, I know that, uh, you just uh, interviewed, uh, you had that whole thing with the Hip Hop Chess Federation. Yeah, with Adisa. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I, I noticed, uh, I, I trained with a couple guys, um, well, not directly, my, they actually teach my kid, the guys from Modern Flow. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, Modern David Flow. David and Alex. Yeah. So yep. uh, props to those guys out there. They do a great job. Um, Make some cool backpacks. Yeah. Um, but they have, of, yeah. they have this great t shirt that I saw. And, um, it's a bunch of chess pieces, and, and they sell um, jujitsu belts with, you know, the chess pieces on it. The, the rooks, the, and yeah, the, 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 there's yeah, a yeah. pawn for the white belt. You know, the the king is the the red belt, queen for black, and you know, the bishop and the rook, purple and blue. But I do see like such a a resemblance with chess and jujitsu. It's you know, their their tagline is when you see a good move, look for a better one. Mm-hmm. And I, I played. My grandfather taught me chess when I was really young, and I've I've taught my kids as well. And I'm not, I'm my, by no means a great chess player or anything like that, but I know that when I'm rolling, um, you know, whether it's with a white belt or a high level guy or whatever, I know that it's very methodical. And if I put my arm in this situation, it's not good for me. It's going to be a checkmate. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, I just, I think that it was really cool that you brought that up and you kind of mix the two. Um, but a lot of those guys train too, don't they? Well, Adisa, yeah, Adisa is doing amazing things. If I could be Adisa when I grow up, I'd be happy. Uh, I mean, he's using jujitsu, hip hop, and um, chess to, as a means to get to the youth of you know his area and various other you know inner cities and whatnot. And it's like whatever the hook is to draw people into jujitsu or into chess or into music, you know, he's using and it's working. He's doing some amazing things. I think where the 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 times that it doesn't match up, it de- jujitsu and chess definitely match up in the idea that it's calculated, it's technique based, there's timing involved, and it's a psychological battle uh, between you and your opponent as much as it's a technical battle between you and them. Where it breaks down is chess. You each get a time to move. Jiu-jitsu, you don't know, like, imagine in the middle of you moving a, a chess piece, the guy gets to move three pieces. Yeah, You're like, oh, yeah. what the hell? So, <laughs> so that point. happens. <laughs> yeah. And then just um, I think that where a lot of people see the, the, the overlap is – and I bet you, Stuart, it's probably the same with your filmmaking career from where you are, to where you started to where you are now. Uh, me with podcasts. It's just anything. It takes time to develop skill. And the more targeted you are in developing whatever skill that is, the better. And I think that the feedback loops that you get immediately through chess, through jujitsu, may reinforce that learning really quickly. If Stuart does a video that he thinks, oh, maybe I'll try this, it may take a while to get the feedback back and to change his overall aesthetic. But if somebody, if Stuart puts his foot in a spot that it's not supposed to be and somebody heel hooks it, you know right away. Yep. Yeah. So I think that it's all about mastering things, whether it be meditation, you know, music, jiu-jitsu, chess, whatever. The process can be used similarly in all these different areas, but is most pronounced through chess, through music, through jiu-jitsu, that people make those connections. I've heard a rule about uh, 10,000 hours for mastery. And, yeah, it's um, from Anders Ericsson. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's uh but they but they also say is once you once you reach that level of mastery with one with one thing whatever it might be, you have an innate ability to master other things much quick much more quickly. You they just your brain is in that motion, it's in the mindset, you know how to learn at that point, so it's easier to pick up other things. Would yeah, you, Musashi you... used to talk about that. Okay, you, yeah, yeah. You see it uh in one thing, you know, see the way narrowly you'll see it broadly or I, i'll screw up the quote if i try it but yeah I, I think part of the process is that you're still just trying to learn learn like at 24 25 years old when stuart started jujitsu when i started jujitsu neither of us had to start anything we could have just been the guys that go down to the corner bar watch whatever you know sports are on and just gone on but we all chose to do something different with our lives and to continue learning and i think that is what 
the, just the spirit of learning is what helps you get better at learning. Does that make agree. any sense? Yeah, I would agree yeah. 100%. Yeah, I, I know that uh, every, every time I start to get like in a funk or depression, um, which happens from time to time, I know that I have to do something. And by doing something, it's not just about thinking. I have to take action and whatever that might be. So uh, like I lifting weights or, or starting running or, you know, entering some type of uh, competition. I, I did Tough Mudder a couple times and, mm -hmm. you know, that was an interesting experience. You know, I froze my ass off. But when I got through it, it was like, you know, that sense of accomplishment, it, it you get this little dopamine and serotonin flush in your brain and it helps you, you know, Helps you get through life, man, because life can beat you down. It can be a real bitch sometimes, but I think you have to have these things that will get you out of a funk, get you into something, get your body moving. I think it's really important that you get your body moving and, and not just use your brain. And and when you can use both at the same time, I, that's just an added bonus in my opinion. And move your hips, not your lips. <laughs> Even if like, you're not training, just going down to the gym, and just hanging out with your friends and just watching and just talking to the instructor. That just, I don't know, just, um, it just helps. It helps, gets you out, gets you out and about. Sometimes I'm like, not in the, I just don't feel like training, but, you know, I'll, I'll go down, do a little bit. I'll tell the, tell the instructor I'm, I'm a bit overtrained, but join in a little bit. But um, I feel better after going there. Yeah. I always feel better when I come out. I know that. Yeah, every time. Yeah, every time. I got a There's... sense of guilt if I don't go. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I've never left a class and gone, oh, I wish I had spent that hour watching TV or those right. two hours. You know, No, you don't, dude. You don't. <laughs> Not once. Yet there have been many times that I go, oh, shit, I wish I could go train right now. <laughs> uh, I should have trained tonight. Why didn't I do it? Mm -hmm. Stu, I wanted, I wanted to ask you, um, the difference is, have you seen any uh, primary difference? UK and Thailand as far as um, maybe a different type of spiritual background in Thailand. Um, how, do you see there's a, a big difference between training um, on continents, different continents? Sorry, what do you mean? A big difference between Thailand and England? Yeah, and... Thailand, England, and uh, the U.S. Do you see uh, underlying differences as far as like uh, cultural backgrounds or spiritual type beliefs? Um, you, you mean uh, like in terms of jujitsu, like um, just in type of in terms of the people that you're training with in those different areas? Do you, yeah, I mean, you... America's you know so far ahead in jujitsu. I remember when I first started jujitsu in the UK. Um, I started at the right time, you know, a good time, you know, because that's when um, we had about I think ten black belts in the UK at the time, and. Um, Thailand, when I went first went over there, it's like um, starting all over again, like in England. Like it's, it's growing in Thailand. But it's like when I first started uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in the UK, you know, it's, and it's getting big. It's getting big fast in Thailand. There's, a lot, um, there's still, there's not many academies. There's very few black belts over in Thailand, but it's a perfect place to have it. It really is. I mean, it's full over there, I'm sure, isn't it? It's amazing. I love Thailand so much. I love the laid back culture. I love how it's cheap and, um, you know, no, people are materialistic. You don't need to walk around wearing, you know, fancy watches and drive a cool car and have a nice house. All you need is a roof over your head because you flip flops you know, and gee pants, right? Yeah, honestly, <laughs> I, mean, I just walk around in my billabong shorts and flip flops all day and my little scooter. It's a, it's hard to explain to people how much of a cool lifestyle it is. And people are like, oh, you can't live that forever. I'm like, why the fuck not? <laughs> yeah. Right, right. And why not? You know? But yeah, everybody has a tendency to say, well, when are you going to grow up? It's like, uh, oh, I well. Know. I, I really don't want to grow up and even if i do grow up i don't know what i want to do when i grow up so i'm just gonna just kind of enjoy the ride yeah just enjoy the ride that's always what i say speaking of enjoying the ride and enjoying the journey paul can you talk to the audience here about the journey podcast uh, how'd you get hooked up with nick probably with open mat radio first and then you guys decided to uh launch a joint podcast so what was that like 
Yeah, so the story behind the journey is kind of a, a funny one in that I had started listening to London Real after I heard uh, Nick on Rogan's podcast. Yeah, same here. Yeah, uh, and I just thought, like, hey, why not shoot a message to this guy on the London Real forum and see if he'll be on Open Mat Radio. You know, he's a black belt. Uh, I liked his ideas. Let's let's do it. Had Nick on the show. We vibed really good. Uh, talked a few times here and there uh, before and afterwards. And I I had approached him. I said, hey, Nick, you know, I'm going through this whole cancer fight and everything. I feel like it'd be pretty pretentious of me to just um, record an episode. I always just assume that no one wants to listen to me talk and that they just want to listen to my guests. That's where I'm at too. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> um, I was like, Nick, you know, I, I I do feel like there's some things that I can pass on that people would benefit from. Would you mind interviewing me? Uh, but I, I want you to come up kind of with the interview so that it doesn't sound pre-planned or, you know, just the, it continues to be an organic kind of thing. Sure. And then that just kind of rolled into uh, you know, Nick split with with Brian from yeah. London Real, uh, which I think sucks because I think Nick brings a lot of uh, perspective and just cool ideas to a populace and a, a group of people that really want to hear them. And yeah, I without think a lot having... of people were upset about that one, but yeah, you I know it is what it is. It's life. I haven't. Li- I've listened to like one or two episodes since uh, yeah. London Real. It's completely changed. It's gone like down a different route. It's a, it's, a, it's more of like a business type of uh, feel yeah. on it now, but yeah. uh, you know, and, and it's great for what it is. You know, it, Brian does a good job of putting it on, and I'm not trying to air any dirty laundry out there. But I know oh, a lot of people not. were were upset. You know that uh, that Nick had left the show and. I resonated a lot more with with Nick than I did with Brian, and uh, I'm just really glad when I heard uh, that he said, you know, there was something planned, and you know, look out for the podcast coming soon. So I was more than happy to promote it when it came out, and um, I hope you guys are getting a, a really good listening follower, or yeah, a good I mean, following over there. To be honest, I don't think either one of us have really looked at numbers at all. I know I haven't. Uh, I'm not sure if Nick has. And our goal right now is just to build up just a following and just to kind of figure out where we're at and hear from the listeners. And it's funny, like I, I get a, a really, what I think is a good response numbers wise, and we don't need to get into the specifics, but I, I get a pretty good response um, from open mat radio. And just an observation I made through social media is I'll get like maybe a lot more likes per se on open mats Facebook page, but on the journeys page, the comments will be way more in depth and way deeper on the journey. Well, it's a so deeper to, podcast for sure. Yeah. Well, and I think like open mat, we hit on a lot of stuff that That's true, yeah. does get deep, but it's just the perspective that everyone's coming from social media wise. Um, so it's, it's been a really cool opportunity. Nick and I didn't know where it was going to go. Some of the things that make it difficult is just the chaos of, you know, Nick doesn't live anywhere. You know, we recorded half our episodes before we even met in person. We just met in L.A. not that long ago. And, um, you know, we've recorded when he's been in Bali and Thailand and London. And so that that is that's what explains to some people that are interested, um, if anyone's interested, why sometimes we'll have three shows in two weeks or three shows in three months. And we're getting better. We're nailing things down. I think it's going to start taking off quite a bit. We've got a lot of things planned for this next uh, couple months that are really going to set things off. And then when you start with no budget or anything, you just use friends and everything. And we were using some listeners to help out with hosting and design and whatnot that turned out to not be as sustainable as what it needs to be. Mm -hmm. So we're slowly making adjustments as we go. But I'm really excited. Uh, I think it'll go... I think it'll go fill in the gap that some people were looking for uh, that was left in London Real. And then for people that don't care so much about jujitsu, uh, it's a great show because we don't stick just to jujitsu. And then for all my jujitsu listeners from Open Mat, it's just we're exploring a whole bunch of stuff that overlaps with things that we end up talking about, you know, on, on Open Mats on the weekend, anyway. So, sure, yeah. I'm just trying to cover all the bases, you know? 
Yeah, so, cool. um, wh- throughout the journey. Yeah, like thank you. About the journey, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. So, um, I don't know if Brian would appreciate that we use that, but Nick's always said it. We've kind of talked back and forth, and it's just, it is. It's about the journey. It fits perfect, and that's why the name came up. We had a bunch of different other names we could have used, but I really wanted to stick with the journey, so that's what we did. Does Brian have a co-host now, London Real? Um, he he does. Uh, he, he flips it up every once in a while. He has uh, sometimes he runs it solo. Sometimes uh, it seems like he has a different co-host um, all the time. It, similar to what I do, I have a um, you know I have a topic on, and I'll try and find a co-host that will that'll be appropriate for the topic. Um, sometimes I have to do it alone, and sure. just because you know in this in this hectic. Uh, times and in lives you know everybody's busy 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 when i first started the podcast uh my work wasn't as intense as it is now the last couple of months have been really intense i've been traveling a lot and working a lot of extra hours so it's it's been difficult being stable with it but what i try and do now is probably you know i just try and record a few like i did uh a couple earlier this week so i'll re- I release them slowly but surely i try and release one every other week to keep it consistent mm-hmm. I, I missed the last one for the first time felt bad about it but you know what man i needed a break you know i quite literally i was dealing with a broken leg couldn't walk for quite a <laughs> while and you know it is what it is so hopefully people can wait two weeks you know it shouldn't yeah. be that big of a deal well, and I think like if you follow kind of like what Stuart has done and what I've tried to do with Open Mat Radio and a million other people have tried with different podcasts and projects, I really believe that in this digital age, if you put out something that's quality and you put out, if you want to get very hippie with it, if you put out a certain energy, it's going to come back to you. I'm all and, for it. I'm all hippied up, man. Yeah, I I I would never have been on this conversation with the two of you guys had I not you know started up a podcast and had I not stepped on the mat, had I not met Nick, like there's so many little tiny crazy coincidences that These have little happened. serendipities, right? Exactly. Serendipitous events. So uh, again, acting is a huge thing. Just get out there and do it. But I really do believe that with the way the internet is functioning, people are turning away from cable and network out media outlets Thank and God. finding yeah. on demand stuff. I would I would much rather pay ten bucks, twenty bucks, whatever it is, um, to go watch a movie if I if I could go down to the Regal movie theater and watch one of Stewart's films. I would love to be able to do that. Right now we're not set up for that, but how great would it be to have there be a day that we could go and just rent out a theater, you know, with a group of jujitsu heads and watch, you know, Stewart's four part ADCC a uh, movie that's coming out. It's pretty sweet. I'd love yeah. to do that. <laughs> That'd be awesome. <laughs> and slowly, I think that when the the premise that oh well, people will come to you know the big media houses for everything is changing to the big media houses having to figure out what people want because choice is so apparent now that eventually I think we're going to see a complete shift in how media is delivered and people like Stuart are going to be able to have their films on the exact same stage as anything out of Hollywood, Bollywood, Tokyo, anywhere else. And I think that'll be really cool someday. Yeah, I think, um, you know, right now we're we're transitioning from an age of broadcasting to an age yeah. of narrowcasting. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's very specific, like um, even with jobs nowadays, like you used to you know, go and work at a company and would be well-versed and, you know, you get your degree in a well-rounded thing and you're doing a lot of things with your career. Well, nowadays everything is so specialized. Like you see a doctor, you know, there's a specialist of a specialist of a specialist. Everything is mm-hmm. real, uh, real close knit. So I think that, you know, in the same lines, we're, we're seeing people being able to pick and choose like with on-demand content and, uh, you know, the podcast realm. I mean, hit up iTunes people. I mean, if you don't like listening to the IGC, you know, there's a hundred thousand podcasts out there. All you have to do is type in a topic and, mm-hmm. you know, just follow the rabbit hole. You'll find something that you like. I guarantee it. You know, I push every two- single jujitsu podcast out there. Go listen to every single one of them. If it brings you closer to the mat, it's a good thing. Yeah. It's yeah. not about, it's not about getting ourselves numbers. It's about pumping up content that we feel is good. You know, I think we're both on, we're all on the same wavelength there. You know, we want to, we want to push people up rather than bring people down. That's, that's what this is about for me. I'm with you hundred percent. Absolutely. Cool guys. Well, Stuart, I know it's getting late over there in the UK. It's been great talking with you guys. Stuart, why don't you go over your Indiegogo a little bit? 
where where can people find you reach out how can they donate yeah um you can actually go on let me just click on the web address i actually have set up an indiegogo campaign um because what people don't know i think because i don't people thought i was making money from this uh, maybe i don't i don't know what people you know what people's perception was but like I said in the video, I was actually making my money from wedding videos. I really got deep into the wedding industry, and I could and I can easily go back to that and make a. I was making a good living, but I like making jujitsu videos. There's more, way more passion that goes into making jujitsu videos, but there's no money in jujitsu. It really isn't. And, <laughs> yeah, uh, there's, I've uh, noticed that even with professionals out there, it seems like everybody's a starving artist, but they're just doing it because they love it. You know. Yeah, and I was putting out these videos for free at first just to get my name out there and because I enjoyed doing it. And still, you know, I was getting better at it. So, you know, um, and they were only like 15 minutes long. Um, but then at some point, um, I realized, I, you know, I'm really like making a hell of a lot of videos here. It's taking up a lot of time. Yeah, you're no longer an amateur at that point. You're you're a professional, you know. Yeah, you should my, be paid. My, my, yeah, my video... Um, filmmaking skills have actually grown alongside my jiu-jitsu at the same time. Um, and I, it just got to the point where I cannot, I cannot make these anymore because even though I've got spot, you'll see logos at the beginning of the video and people think, oh, you must be making money off these sponsors. Like, no, it like just... Yeah, just you have to have that makes, many sponsors, right? <laughs> yeah, just about makes ends meet. Not even that. I get free... Some of these sponsors, I just get free gear. Mm-hmm. You know, like um, you know, yeah, Stuart's not alpha. paying his bills in t-shirts. Like, <laughs> he is right. Yeah. yeah, I'm like, I have my bank account is zero. You know, <laughs> zero. But look, that's why I live in Thailand. I love the simple life. I'm not a guy that goes out and buys fancy things. I don't care about that stuff. You know, I care about lifestyle and happiness. You know, and being happy, being happy with what you do. So you know, I'm happy making. I really enjoy making these. Um, uh, jiu-jitsu videos i see that i'm doing something positive i get emails every day saying that that this video changed their life you know some emails and obviously i'm not going to mention any names but i've had people who are like suicidal you know and who've watched my videos and said that it's changed their life you know <laughs> um, oh, man, some people are, are in deep depression you know and, I've, and my videos have made a big impact on them so I want to carry on making them because I see her making a difference. Plus, I enjoy it. I'd love it to become a full-time job. So what I've uh, set up a, an Indiegogo campaign because we also want to see this sport grow is I'm going to make 20, you know, full documentaries. I'm talking like uh, I'm going to bring out five-minute trailers alongside with a 40-minute, you know, 30 to 40 or maybe one-hour documentaries but I'm going to make 20 of them in 12 months. So I'm really wow. trying to raise $50,000, which really isn't, it's not that much. And it's just going to like, f- from the money I've made, I've raised $6,395 in about a week. And that's now paying for me. I've already got my flight over to Roy Dean Academy. And that's going to be one of my first videos with the money I've just raised. And then from there, I'll fly to San Diego and finish off my film with Keenan Cornelius and Andre Calvo and uh, also try and fit in Jeff Glover. But then I have to go back to Thailand. But then I'm covered um, with editing till January where I'm going to take off to America again. Um, and again, you know, like go around like, you know, I'm actually going to get the public, the, the, the judicial community to vote who they want me to make a documentary on. That's cool. Um, but I, I need to get, I need Joe Rogan. Like, I really want to do a jiu-jitsu documentary on Joe Rogan because, you know, I think everyone wonders. I mean, everyone knows that guy's good. And if you mm-hmm. could cool see just a specific jiu-jitsu video on Joe Rogan, uh, Eddie Bravo too, Marcelo Garcia, I really want to do. Um, so, yeah, that's my campaign. It's in, indiegogo.com forward slash projects forward slash Stuart Cooper films. Um, so, yeah, I mean, um, there's a bunch of perks in there. If you donate different, different amounts of uh, money, it ranges from you can donate anything. You know, I've had <laughs> like it's literally ranged from um, 
45 cents to a thousand dollars in terms of donations like that's what it's ranged from some people donate ten dollars five dollars like i said one dollar some guy generously donated one thousand dollars i was like holy crap that was generous (laughs) (laughs) that's awesome oh and he obviously sees what i'm doing and then i had one hater on youtube saying i can't believe you have the nerve to go and scrounge money while you go around traveling around the world doing your jiu-jitsu and making amateur videos so i just (laughs) and paste this um message you know i left it anonymous uh, how my videos have changed this guy's life and just posted it back to him and said, well, whatever you're going to say about that, I'm making a difference. You obviously have no idea what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to make the sport grow. And, you know, it is it is for, for some, it is making an impact in people's lives, you know. So, yeah. Well, you can go what and- you're doing, Stuart. I, really, I mean, I, I can't stress enough people out there. Check it out on StuartCooperFilms.com. Um, and Stuart, you still is, doing the VIP list? Yes, still doing it. Yeah. Explain so that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, just, I actually need to get a, I need to get a good website guy because next year after this Indiegogo campaign, what I'm thinking of doing is um, making a pay per view website where I just charge people like one dollar. That's it, one dollar to watch a video because my videos, some of them get, they go up to a hundred thousand views. So I know I'm not going to get that if it's pay-per-view because people pirate, you know, mm-hmm. uh, like they do with Meta Morris or the Cheeky Bastards. But, uh, <laughs> you know, even if it's that 100,000 is 30,000, that's that's still a lot. And that's just one video. So hopefully I'm going to – that's what I'm going to introduce and try next year in 12 months' time as a pay-per-view site. Cool, man. You need to get a good, get hold of a good website designer, and re, because my website is so old, all the videos you see in it are outdated. I need, it's very, I need, I've not touched it for a long time. Yeah, well, it looks good. I'm looking right at it right now. So, yeah, yeah. but the yeah, VIP it looks list, it's what StuartCooperFilms.com/slash/vip, and that's where people can sign up and follow all the stuff that you got going on, right? Oh yeah, or StuartCooperFilms.com forward slash support. Support. Uh, okay. Yeah, but, but people are best off actually going on my Facebook page and just just look up Stuart Cooper Films on Facebook. That's actually I I really that's kind of my my way my main website really. Paul, why don't you tell us where uh, where they can find you with Open Mad Radio, the journey and and all that yeah. good stuff. Uh, the, the fastest way, just like Stu said, is, um, you know, Facebook, we're on, uh, the journey podcast and open mat radio are my two podcasts, uh, the journey podcast.com for the website and then open mat radio.com for open mat radio, of course. But, uh, you can just sign up on our RSS feed or iTunes or Stitcher. If you're trying to download the show each week and never even have to deal with going to the websites or you can stream them right from the sites. But I would encourage everybody to please uh, support Stuart in his Indiegogo campaign. I think that if you look at a budget of a shoe, like a a very shoestring budget of um, a major film, it's nowhere near what Stuart's asking for for the year, and that includes like him being able to eat and travel and all this. Yeah. So I think the quality he kicks out is way beyond what he's doing with the budget he has. And if anyone's ever had a day that they went to train that they weren't going to or they got onto the mat or back onto the mat because they watched the Stuart Cooper film, throw the dude a couple bucks and say thank you. For sure. I stole this line from Denny uh, Prokopos, who when he's always talking about uh, the mastering the system stuff on 10th Planet site, he's like, hey, it costs the same as a coffee and a Danish. So if you can't skip a coffee and a Danish for um, taking that money and sending it to, to Stu, then you probably shouldn't be watching his films. But that's just my opinion. Um, our stuff, just, yeah, support Stuart. Go to uh, support our our sponsors, I guess, if you want to call them sponsors, um, on the mat.com, uh, lucky gee, best jujitsu brand out there, uh, as far as giving back to the community. Yeah. Scotty uh, Nelson's an awesome dude. He's Scotty's, yep. Scotty's I enjoyed that interview I heard with you guys, uh, with, uh, Scotty. It was a good show. Yeah. So anywhere that, 
you see a gi, um, Scotty's either been there or is going to be there or <laughs> had some part of, of, of that history and is the hardest working guy in jiu-jitsu and doesn't get nearly enough credit for all that he's done. So support him at onthemat.com. Uh, and Lucky Gi. And then also, you know, I got a ton of friends with different brands and stuff, uh, Monto. And there's all I would say is use your money wisely, whether it's in the realm of jujitsu, podcasting, anything. Support brands and companies and people that give back to the community and have, you know, a positive kind of vibe to them. So I know Stuart gives back to jujitsu in amazing ways. I know that, you know, you with your podcast, you're doing the same thing. You're giving back. No one told you you had to record this last hour, hour and a half and give it back. So I always sit, tell people to or at least encourage them to please vote with their money and support causes of people that give back and create things instead of just um, throwing your money away to, you know, just any old random brand. So that that's my message. But, yeah, open at radio, the journey podcast dot com. Very cool, guys. All right. Well, I just want to say thanks again for both of you for making it. Um, I know we thanks had a lot of time zones to set up. Um, I just appreciate the flexibility with everybody and uh, being able to come on. I really enjoyed this conversation. It was uh, sometimes I get a, a, a bit nervous with different guests and things like that, but this one was it was real smooth, man. I I, uh, I really enjoyed talking with both of you. Yeah, um, it was fun. In yeah, the thank episode, you so much for the opportunity too. Hey, it's it's great. It's uh, I'm glad you guys are part of the IGC crew now. Mm-hmm. Um, Thanks. In the episode notes, I'll uh, I'll have some information on where you can find uh, Stuart and Paul and their projects. Um, there's a homework assignment I want you guys to do this week: is try something that you're afraid of, whether it be jujitsu, whether it be um, booking your your flight for jumping out of a plane, doing some skydiving, or um, a mud run, or a marathon, or whatever you guys want to do. Just do something that's out of your comfort zone. Um, I promise you. Um, even if you get hurt doing it, it might be worth doing. <laughs> <laughs> Go um, meditate. Yep. You're not going to get hurt meditating, and you might just change your whole life. That's true. It has for me. That's that's for damn sure. You can discuss with us. You can uh, check out the website directly, intellectualgentlemensclub.com. All the previous podcasts are on there for free. We have uh, a brief bio of everybody who's been on the show, their prospective projects, where you can donate to them. Um, we're on iTunes for free. We're on Stitcher. Uh, YouTube. You can uh, listen to us all over the place. We're in a lot of different podcast directories. We're on Twitter at IGC Cast, uh, Intellectual Gentlemen's Club, and Facebook. We're on Google Plus. We're pretty much you can find us if you Google us for sure, people. So use the donate button for our guests. Hit up our our support page. Uh, today we're going to have the exit music by Black Mill. It's a UK artist, uh, The Spirit of Life. I know I've heard uh, I've heard them on your uh, a couple of your videos, Stuart. So yeah, well, that's, that'd be that's fitting. Dance. Nick Nick Gregoriadis has good taste in music. <laughs> yeah, he does. That was his choice. Very cool. All right. Well, uh, thanks for listening out there, and hope I talk to you guys again soon. Yeah, yeah come on out to Vegas. Come train. Next time I come to Vegas. Cool. All right, guys. Hang loose out there. Cool. Thanks. Back to you.
never said I was a gentleman, motherfuckers. Actually.